I think the biggest disappointment in many ways actually is what's happened in the United States because I really didn't think that you know the country would be capable of electing someone like Trump and I didn't think that many Americans would be capable of being so fanatically attached to him. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. I'm delighted to welcome you to season two of the show. And I'm particularly pleased that my first guest this season is Francis Fukuyama, one of the most influential political thinkers of our time and someone who has written extensively on international politics and issues of development. He's a senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the director of the Institute's Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. I spoke with Frank in mid-December 2020 at the height of the controversies surrounding the U.S. presidential election and President Trump's refusal to acknowledge defeat. And while a new president will shortly be sworn in on the 20th of January, deep political divisions remain in the United States. It is therefore particularly useful and timely to revisit Frank Fukuyama's major two-volume work on the origins of political order and political decay. In these two fascinating books published in 2011 and 2014, he provides an account of how societies develop strong, impersonal and accountable political institutions. We also discussed his first book, The End of History and the Last Man, published in 1992, and his latest, published in 2018, titled Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment. On a personal note, I've had the pleasure of knowing Frank for over a decade now. We were not only former colleagues at Stanford University, but also lived on the same street, And every other day, Frank would jog past our house in Palo Alto. He's also one of the most versatile people I know. When he's not writing books and articles or giving a talk, you may find him woodworking in his garage in Palo Alto or in the picturesque town of Carmel in California. Check out his Instagram profile if you don't believe me. He's also a brilliant photographer who also happens to make a perfect grilled burger. In this episode, we discuss issues related to political development and political decay, state building, the relationship between democracy and development, and the rise of China. I hope you enjoy our conversation. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you, Frank. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we last met in Oslo in February of this year. And since then, of course, the whole world has been ravaged by COVID. And your own country, the United States, has struggled to contain the pandemic. And you've also had an election, the results of which continue to be challenged by the incumbent. So let me ask you, um, or begin by asking you the following question, Frank. How can citizens get their populist leaders, like your president, to stop attacking liberal democracy? Uh, I don't think that there's an easy answer to that question. Uh, Normally, if you are living in a democracy, uh, the answer would be you vote. Uh, You mobilize people and um, you get them to vote the populist leader out of power. That's the most decisive check on their power. Uh, What we're facing in the United States is something that really doesn't have any precedent in any modern developed democracy, which is uh, a leader that simply refuses to leave office and, you know, invents facts and claims that he was the victim of uh, massive fraud, 
uh, and that is simply not true. Uh, and um, that's why it's a little bit difficult to figure out what to do about it, because um, uh, because we really have not faced this kind of situation. Most democratic leaders uh, stay within a normative framework where they accept the fact that if you lose an election, you you bow out. Uh, but uh, you know we have a demagogue right now that hasn't done that. Now that being said, Joe Biden is going to take office on January 20th. Donald Trump will no longer be president, but we're still left with a situation in which you know maybe a third of the country uh, believes that uh, Biden was president only as a result of massive fraud, and that's obviously not a good thing uh, going forward. Moving on to to much of your work that in many ways has highlighted the, the difficulties of say creating and maintaining effective political institutions. And, you know, you've you've highlighted the fact that governments that are not just, you know, it's not just important to have governments that are just powerful and respect the rule of law, but are also accountable. And when I read your work, a common thread, of course, that 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 comes out is that you're interested in better understanding how we should be building an effective state. This theme is explored in these two really impressive and extremely well-written volumes on the origins of political order and political order and political decay. And one of the many conclusions you arrive at in these two books is perhaps the fact that political development in the modern world took place under very different conditions than, say, those in the period up to until the late 18th century. So, so the question here I have for you is, what would you say are the major differences in these two periods? Uh, well, I think uh, historically, the way that uh, political orders develop, first of all, extended over much longer periods of time. Uh, you take an issue like sequencing. You know, you have a state, a democracy, rule of law, uh, and one of the questions, and, and also other dimensions of development like economic growth. And one of the questions that um, comparative political scientists have been looking at is what's the best sequence in which to introduce these different um, uh, types of institutions. Uh, and there was an argument that Samuel Huntington originally made uh, way back in the 1960s for an authoritarian transition where you would begin with economic growth that would create the social basis for uh, an eventual transition to uh, democracy. And this actually is, uh, you know, the pattern that a number of European countries followed. I mean, they didn't start with democracy. Uh, actually, I would say prior to economic growth, uh, countries like Britain and the Netherlands had uh, a workable rule of law that then permitted um, uh, economic growth to happen as economic growth happened. They uh, developed demands, uh, middle class, and then demands for greater political participation and eventually uh, democracy. I think one of the problems right now is that because we're at the uh, end of this process where we've seen successful development, uh, it's very hard to sequence. If you're a country, let's say, coming out of communism, like Poland or Hungary or um, Ukraine, uh, it was not possible uh, at that moment of transition to say, well, we're going to behave like Singapore. We'll have an authoritarian government uh, for the next generation. We're going to get rich. And then after that, we're going to transition to democracy. Uh, you've unleashed popular demands for participation, which are going to happen regardless of what level of development you're at. And in any event, it's not as if there's an elite in these countries that's controlling things such that you can say, okay, first we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this in another generation. Uh, the demands for change on all fronts uh, is very strong, and I don't think that you can, you know, you can seriously sequence in the way that uh, historically countries were able to uh, to do that. The other the other thing that I'm acutely aware of is the fact that we live in a very different international environment uh, where the connections between countries is very uh, tight. Information, uh, people, um, ideas flow across borders much more readily than they did uh, a few hundred years ago. 
Uh, this is good in many respects because you can learn things from the experience of other countries. You don't have to constantly keep reinventing the wheel. Uh, but it's also the case that you import things like rising expectations and um, disruptive uh, trends in technology and, and other things much more rapidly than you did uh, at another point. Uh, you do have an international development community uh, which tries to promote the development of poor countries. This is something unprecedented until really the 1950s. It, it used to be that to the extent that rich countries paid attention to poor countries, it was to exploit them. And all of a sudden, you've got this big international industry uh, where rich countries try to transfer resources to poor countries. Uh, and well, as you well know, that sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't work. Um, but that's also a very different uh, condition from what used to prevail. Uh, so I would say that those are some of the, you know, the big differences right now. I'm glad you mentioned uh, both of these aspects because um, in parts of your uh, the first volume, of course, you talk about you know sequencing, uh, and um, I'm not sure it's the first or the second volume where you also talk about the the fact that maybe strong bureaucracies or having them first well established matters than let's say you know a quick transition to democracy. I, I, I don't know if I've understood that correctly. Uh, but but there is that sequencing, right? That that countries yes. that have had a strong relationship or a strong tradition of of uh, or a tradition of strong bureaucracies, they've done better. Well, I think that uh, that's a general condition of development. Uh, I would say um, if you don't have appropriate state capacity and if you don't build state capacity, it's actually very hard to uh, accomplish anything. And you can see many democracies that. Uh, really don't have the capacity to deliver basic services at the level that people today expect them uh, that have consequently gotten into a lot of trouble. So I think that's um, that's correct. Uh, I would say, however, that the process of building a modern state is also something that happens incrementally. Uh, and um, it's not something that can be done quickly because it's really a matter of human capital and building human capital in your state structure is usually a you know a, a work of it's a it's a kind of multi generational work, right? Because that explains why you've been you know critical of attempts at implanting institutions without perhaps understanding how these institutions originate and how there are all of these accidental or contingent forces as you call them that come into being. Because it is difficult to create a modern and impersonal state, right? And and maybe the international community is in a hurry, and um, maybe you know they don't quite understand how one should go about transforming countries like Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan into what you call you know this idea of getting to Denmark. That it's it's about you know the problem of creating a modern political institution or institutions. And Denmark here is of course not exactly Denmark the country but the mythical place where, for you, it is all a matter of stable, democratic, inclusive, peaceful, prosperous institutions and very little corruption. So, you know, I mean, so my question here then is, based on this exhaustive review of all the historical cases and all the literature that you've, that you've looked into, Frank, what would you highlight as the key lessons about state building? Is it in, in in addition to the sequencing aspect, you know, what should these various actors be 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 focusing on? Is it better understanding the local conditions, the the, the historical uh, roots of these institutions? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that this kind of state building is ultimately going to be brought about by anyone other than political actors within each country. Uh, they're the ones that have to. Um, bring that about. Uh, partly, it's a matter of power. Uh, if you want to, for example, get rid of a corrupt elite, you have to get, get them out of power and replace them with a, uh, a different kind of elite. Uh, and that requires a lot of political struggle. The other issue that is very important is that there needs to be a parallel nation building process in addition to the state building process. Uh, you could define state building as a building of 
visible formal institutions like bureaucracies uh, and tax bases and, and uh, you know, police forces, uh, this sort of thing. The nation building is an intangible project. It, it's a project that leads to an intangible outcome, which is a shared sense of their destiny, a sh shared sense of narratives. People don't have to agree on everything, uh, but they have to believe that they live in the, you know, common, you know, under a common set of uh, rules and share a certain minimal set of values for the society to cohere. And that is a matter of, um, I think, controlling, nar well, not controlling, but shaping narratives. And it's also a matter of education because people need to learn these narratives, you know, as they grow up and absorb them uh, and so forth. And this, uh, even less than the state building project, is something that really has to be done by people who understand their own society, that are able to call upon historical memories, who understand, you know, cultural symbols and use those to build this sense of common citizenship. I was uh, particularly fascinated in uh, political order and political decay with the example you use of the U.S. Forest Service which was characterized by merit-based recruitment. It was autonomous. And this to you was a very good example, right, of American state building. But this very same institution is now often considered to be dysfunctional. So why is it that political development is often reversed by political decay? And how does this decay take place? I think that... Uh... You can see actually uh, an, an example of this going on in the United States, actually, unfortunately, multiple examples like our Centers for Disease Control and Food and Drug Administration, where you had very high capacity agencies that were run by professionals, long term civil servants that had a lot of expertise. Uh, but then you get a political master that actually wants to use those agencies for short-term political purposes. Now, in democratic theory, obviously, if you have an election, it has consequences. The newly elected president and legislature get to set uh, the agenda for, for bureaucrats. Uh, but, you know, they also need to respect the fact that the bureaucrats have expertise about certain issues and not override, you know, that advice with their own, um, you know, short-term uh, political uh, demands like you know help in in the next election that's coming up in in uh, in a few months, uh, and so this you know in our country has led to this corruption of both of those agencies. And there's unfortunately many other examples of this. I, you know what I said in my political orders books was that it's kind of inevitable that this happened because in a certain sense. Having a modern state is an unnatural situation. It's unnatural to choose your public officials on the basis of merit and qualifications, as opposed to favoring uh, friends and family or political supporters or people that uh, you've come to know and, and trust. I mean, you see a really, I think, kind of gross example of this just with the way that the Trump family has been used, you know, to. Uh, uh, staff this administration. Um, but I think in general, this kind of reversion to political patronage is something that tends to happen over time. When I wrote Political Order and Political Decay, this was well before the rise of Trump. And, you know, what I saw there was uh, the rise of very powerful organized interest groups in the United States, lobbyists, uh, rent seeking organizations that in an extended period of peace and prosperity had managed to capture important parts of the government so that it was impossible for democratic will to prevail over these kinds of entrenched uh, interests. And I think, in fact, one of the reasons you have populism is that there's a broad sense that this has happened and, and you know, broad unhappiness with it. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's part of a longer term political decay problem. Yeah, because you've also written about how 
institutions perhaps decay because they're just not flexible enough perhaps to to adapt to changing circumstances, right? Or maybe there's just well, too much political interference and loss of autonomy. Well, that's uh, that's correct. I mean, actually, sometimes it, if you have too much autonomy, that contributes to the rigidity, and sometimes you need to have the thing shaken up from the outside. Um, but the shaking up actually has to do something positive, and like the way that we've been shaken up in the last four years. But um, uh, yeah, in general, uh, institutions are stable rules or patterns of behavior that persist beyond uh, you know, the tenure of the officials that are actually running them uh, at any given point. Uh, that's part of why human societies have been successful is that we can create institutions and stable rules that you know, govern our behavior. But uh, external uh, developments happen, you get exogenous shocks, you get broad social changes. And if those institutions don't continually adapt themselves to those new uh, uh, conditions, then you're going to get uh, uh, bad results because the system will be too rigid. I mean, you know, in the U.S. Constitution, we have quite a number of issues like this right now that lead to a failure of representation. The Electoral College privileges small states and certain swing states way over you know, other more populous states, as an example, or the current way we do districting, uh, which similarly privileges um, rural areas over big cities. And it's impossible to fix this system because that very distribution of power that privileges certain groups over others means that they don't want to see any change. And the rules uh, require, you know, in, in American constitutional change, huge super majorities to bring about a change in the rules uh, and that can be vetoed by the you know the groups that would be hurt by those changes and so that's why you get locked into this kind of long-term rigidity where you see a problem existing but you can't really do anything about it so this reminds me of of course what huntington uh, said were crucial aspects of um, the development of political institutions and 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 certain characteristics like um, you know it's important that they're complex or they're adaptable they're autonomous and coherent but these very same features would perhaps sometimes lead to decay and even democracy itself could lead to decay of institutions uh well social change happens all the time and i think what he was concerned about was the failure of um political institutions to absorb demands for participation as societies changed. And this is something that's been happening in the developing world, you know, for decades now that you get, um, you get social and economic uh, development, people move to cities, you get big urban populations, you get groups mobilized that hadn't been mobilized before. Uh, and the political system is still run by an elite that was appropriate for a, you know, very smaller rural agrarian society where uh, things were locally controlled by big landlords or, you know, urban elites or, or you know, groups like that. Uh, and by failing to accommodate the, you know, those rising uh, forces, uh, you get decay. I mean, you can, like a specific example of this, you know, was Argentina, where the country uh, was one of the fastest growing economies in the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And this brought about massive social change. Uh, just like in Europe, you had the growth of big cities, you had the growth of um, industrial and industrial workforce, a proletariat, you had the rise of labor unions. All of this represents massive social mobilization and social change. Uh, the society had been controlled by a very narrow elite of large landowners in the 19th century. And many of those um, elites saw this change happening with the rise of the radical party and new demands for increasing the franchise and so forth. They didn't like it. Uh, and they eventually saw no way out other than non-democratic means. And so in 1930, they backed a military coup d'etat that unseated the democratic government and then led to the next, well, I mean, we're still not out of this period of, of uh, you know, 
vacillations between democratic choice and authoritarian dictatorship, highly unstable politics and the like. Uh, if you contrast that to Britain, uh, it's an interesting contrast because in Britain, the conservative landed elite um, was in a way much more farsighted and, and uh, adaptable. So they passed three big reform bills in 1832, 1857, and then in the 1880s that gradually uh, extended the franchise. The second reform bill uh, in the 1850s was actually fascinating because it was promoted by Benjamin Disraeli, uh, this you know, famous uh, uh, great uh, conservative prime minister. And at that time, he was criticized by members of the Tory party for betraying the interest of that party because he was going to allow all of the these new rising middle class uh, and working class uh, people to start voting in uh, in British elections. Uh, but he understood that if you don't adapt, you're going to die. And it turned out that he was correct that, you know, with the expanded franchise, the Conservative Party actually continued to win votes. And uh, as a result, uh, it remained a dominant party in British politics, you know, uh, through the 20th century. So those are, you know, cases, I think, of the failure to adapt in Argentina's case, which leads to a real political disaster and a system that has enough flexibility to uh, shift the rules, which was Britain in the 19th century. My uh, listeners would, of course, be surprised and perhaps even disappointed if I did not ask you about your famous 1989 essay, In the National Interest, and the resulting book from 1992, The End of History and the Last Man. The original essay received then and still continues to receive a lot of attention, Frank, 31 years after you wrote it. And I remember you were going to Munich when we met in Oslo to talk about this. And um, what I find fascinating is that the idea perhaps or your your uh, theory is not perhaps as controversial or as outlandish as some have considered it to be because you were really offering a theory of modernization, were you not? That there were these two major challenges to liberalism of fascism and communism. They failed. And the real question was, where was modernization, the process of modernization going? And rather than communism that the Marxists were saying would constitute the end of history, you were saying in 88, 89, that um, we would stop at the stage before communism. And, and I know you're, you're sick and tired of answering these questions, but some of the common misunderstandings, as I understand, is related to the phrase itself, right? The end of history, which you borrowed from Hegel. And history, of course, you, for you, was about modernization and development. And end was about not about termination, but it was about some sort of an objective. So it was all about, as I understand it, that the, the end point of this process of modernization would be some version of a market-based economy and some version of liberal democracy. Now, que the question is, Frank, have you changed your thoughts and your ideas since then? If so, how? Because I've heard you say that you've refined the argument over the years. You've often used the word also, you've rewritten it in the two volumes that we've just discussed. And, and so the question is, do you still believe in that argument um, that there is no alternative model of human prosperity, that development requires a market economy tied to liberal democracy? Uh, I think that um, there's a couple of things that are obviously different. Uh, you know, the world in 1989 or in 1992, when the book was published, uh, you know, really was a different place in many ways because uh, we were in the midst of this big expansion of the third wave of democratization that really lasted up until the mid 2000s. Uh, and the momentum was on the side of people protesting authoritarian governments and then uh, changing regimes to you know more democratic ones. And now we're in a period of very serious uh, backsliding democratic recession, including in well-established democracies like the United States and um, 
uh, you know, other uh, European countries. Uh, so there's no question that the political uh, fortunes of democracy have uh, have have hit a big uh, uh, setback. Uh, in terms of the underlying argument, whether in the long-term perspective there is an alternative, higher form of organization, social and political organization, to liberal democracy tied to a market economy, that I'm not so sure of. Uh, and this is something I've been saying for the last 30 years, the only alternative system that seems to have any plausible chance of actually turning out better is that of China, because it is authoritarian. Uh, it has succeeded in producing high levels of economic growth and now technological innovation. Uh, and, you know, what I've said consistently is if it proves to be stable in a way that democracies are not and continues to produce these levels of growth, then I think the thesis is is wrong. Uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I don't think that, you know, it's clear that the Chinese system can be um, uh, can be sustainable politically over a longer period of time and continue to produce both the political and the economic uh, outcomes. I think, you know, as a normative matter also, <laughs> there are big problems with it because it doesn't produce uh, an attractive society in many ways. You know, there's very little Chinese soft power being uh, exercised today. People love getting an infrastructure project and lots of Chinese investment, but you know, very few societies want to emulate Chinese, what they perceive as Chinese culture or you know, Chinese social values. Um, so in that respect, I think the thesis is still there, but you know, it was always a question rather than, a, uh, rather than an assertion. It's interesting about you know this thing about China, Frank, because um, you know you're right that there isn't uh, much of that kind of soft power that China has in comparison to say India. You know, there's no Bollywood or or yoga and that kind of stuff or democracy. But I would argue that maybe China's soft power could be understood as it, its record at uh, reducing poverty, it, of uh, promoting well-being, you know, this kind of China model of development and its emphasis on South-South cooperation, uh, no political interference. All of this, I would argue, appears pretty attractive. The fact that it can build infrastructure that no other country can build on that scale so in a way, you know, that is, I suppose, for me, what makes the Chinese model more attractive to some countries, say in sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, yeah. No, I, like I said, I think that it is the economic model that, there's, that is their main selling point. Uh, but I think to be a world-beating civilization, <laughs> you have to offer, uh, you know, a full, full-service menu and um, economic growth, you know, uh, by itself uh, may not uh, may not do it in the end, um, and you know it still remains to be seen whether that economic model is sustainable. You know, one of the things that's happening is that you know year by year, month by month, Chinese Communist Party is basically undermining the private sector in uh, in China to the point where. You know, we're just going to have to admit that this really doesn't, it isn't a market-based economy at all. It's, its you know, some kind of strange, it's a hybrid, not between a market economy and, and state capitalism, but it's a hybrid between central planning and state capitalism. Uh, and whether that actually can produce innovation and growth over a long period of time, uh, as opposed to you know, seizing up because of its own rigidities. Uh, again, that's something that remains to be seen. What about, um, you know, the role of culture and Huntington's clash of civilizations, that culture is the ultimate way in which societies define themselves, that there will be some, how many, was it seven or eight cultural groups that would dominate, that, um, you know, there's no reason to think that one would develop uh, similar types of political institutions? Well, this uh, this is an issue I dealt with in my last book, Identity, uh, where 
you know, I argued, and actually this is simply a reprise of an argument that I actually made in the end of history in The Last Man, that, that one of the threats to a liberal society is um, uh, is this quest for identity where you have uh, the desire to, a communitarian desire to be bound to other people on the basis of, it could be religion, it could be nation, it could be, you know, skin color. It could be uh, gender. Uh, you know, there are many other uh, forms of community that provide a stronger sense of community and you know, fellow feeling than a liberal society, which uh, is based on a kind of universal understanding of, of human uh, rights and human values. Uh, and this um, could be civilizational. That's what Huntington was arguing, but I think in the modern world, it tends to be much, much narrower than that, uh, that people are bonding in much smaller communities. So, you know, there's no such thing as an Asian civilization. There's China, there's Japan, there's Korea. And even within these countries, there are regions where you know, people feel very strong ties with one another. Uh, so you have a lot of identity conflict, but uh, I don't think it's really the same as the kind of civilizational conflict that Huntington was talking about. The only part of the world that fits that description a little bit better is the uh, Muslim world, where there is a kind of formal, long-standing belief in a Muslim ummah. But, you know, the reality of the Muslim world today has been this civil war between Sunnis and Shiites and between different sex within uh, each of these groups. And I don't think that that, you know, is acting as a coherent civilizational block. Yeah, because I, I do think, you know, I think it's really fascinating how your first book is connected with your most recent one, because uh, one of, I, re I reread that 1989 essay, Frank, recently, and I, and I noticed that you wrote that you were actually pretty worried about the end of history, because that would be a very sad time, you said, that and I quote, you know, the, the struggle for recognition, the willingness to risk one's life for a purely abstract goal, the worldwide ideological struggle that called for daring, courage, imagination, and idealism will be replaced by economic calculation, the endless solving of technical problems, um, et cetera, and end quote. And, and you've often, in your talks, you've uh, highlighted the fact that, you know, what is often lost is the, the, the last part of the title of your book, The Last Man, the Nietzsche's idea, right? That there's this kind of a man without anger or pride and aspiration because all of his needs are taken care of. But you basically make that argument that humans may not like that situation. There's this inherent desire we have for a struggle to rebel. And in the identity book, you highlight the Greek word tumos, which is the human demand for respect and recognition. And without such recognition, we get angry. And modern politics is therefore about this struggle for recognition. So the question is, is it this lack of recognition that many groups around the world feel? Is it is it the fault of globalization? As a lot of people are saying it is, it's the elites that have benefited, it's the elites who do not offer adequate recognition of these angry people, and, and that this is perhaps the most important factor undermining liberal democracy? Well, I think that's a, a very large part of it. Uh, I think that there's been this huge divide that's opened up uh, between uh, urban, you know, modern uh, agglomerations uh, where you have large numbers of relatively well-educated people that are open to globaliz globalization and, you know, the international uh, world uh, versus more conservative rural areas. And that's really sociologically been the basis of power for uh, populist politicians from Putin and Erdogan to Trump and, you know, the English conservatives. Um, and that, uh, I think, is partly an economic divide uh, because the urban areas are the ones that have been growing uh, most rapidly. But I think the cultural divide is more important. And that's where the, you know, the issue of respect uh, comes in, where many people feel that um, many important decisions were taken without um, consulting them or without regard to their interests or not even disregarding their 
interest. You know, it just elites not even being aware that there were people, uh, you know, that may not like some of the choices they made, like entering into these trade pacts or uh, outsourcing jobs, you know, to um, uh, to other countries. Uh, so I do think that um, uh, it's respect and and you know the same thing works on the other side. I think that uh, a lot of the social justice movements are really movements about respect. And you think about the Me Too movement. Some of the great heroes of that movement are actually actresses or you know pretty well off people that can't really be regarded in any way as uh, as economic victims. But nonetheless, you know, as women, they are being disrespected by the people that, by the men that that harass them, and so that issue is really entirely a matter, I think, of uh, respect. It has economic dimensions as well in terms of pay equity and, and so forth. But I think the thing that, you know, really underlies a lot of the anger is is the is the disrespect that. Um, sexual harassment uh, uh, reveals towards women. Uh, so yes, I think you know that is a large part of our politics these days. But related to this, Frank, is, is this whole problem of global governance, this lack of collective action and accountability and lack of democracy at the international level, perhaps, you know, weak organizations. The UN can't be expected to, to, to solve these uh, very important issues that one perhaps requires other international institutions. What are your thoughts on that, on global governance as you see it? I mean, your own country is pulling back or will perhaps reverse its decision of pulling back out of the the WHO and, um, and, and President Trump has undermined multilateralism. And, and you've often in the past argued that, um, Perhaps U.S. dominance uh, around the world—it's uh, you know—it's it, been hegemonic and and maybe anti—and because of that, there's been a lot of anti-Americanism. So, do you see that changing in the next few years in terms of how global governance will evolve? Well, I think uh, Biden is going to reverse a lot of the decisions that Trump made about uh, NATO, about you know alliances, about of the WHO about uh, the Paris uh, Climate Accords. Uh, But I actually don't see that we're going to be making a lot of big advances in um, creating new multilateral institutions to handle some of these problems, even though the demand for them is there. uh, Because I do think that a lot of the populist backlash has been uh, based on deep suspicion of, you know, delegating authority to these international bodies. And there's a certain, you know, there's a certain justification for that because uh, a lot of them are really not under uh, any kind of democratic accountability. Uh, So I don't really see a political basis for uh, expansion. I think, you know, right now, the best you can hope for is actually just to defend the ones that it exist or have been created in the past. And some of them, I think, will continue to weaken. I think most of the trade liberalization agreements uh, are getting a hard second look by a lot of people, including, you know, some of the economists that were their biggest supporters, uh, you know, 20 years ago. move on to to democracy frank uh, it's just so fun talking to you so i have tons of things i would like to talk to you about so um you got to stop me at some point from asking you all <laughs> these questions but you've argued in your work that a successful modern liberal democracy must combine three sets of institutions but in a stable balance we're talking about the state we're talking about the rule of law and finally accountable government and that maintaining this stable balance constitutes what you term the miracle of modern politics, as it is not always obvious, right, that these three can be combined. But in the past couple of decades, we've been witnessing a democratic recession. And many countries have that were part, perhaps, of this third wave of democratization, as Huntington had put it, they've either 
you know, gone back to authoritarianism or their democratic institutions have been eroded or weakened. So I'm wondering then, what explains this uh, democratic recession? Is it the lack of performance in terms of delivering uh, public services? Uh, we've talked about this many times before. Is it the lack of trust in the government? Is it weak state legitimacy? Is it um, the decay of democratic institutions and renewed interest in um, pursuing patrimonialism? Is it all of these and more? What explains this democratic well, recession? I don't think that you can uh, generalize. And I think that, uh, in fact, what you need to do is not see this all as one single phenomenon, but several different ones that may lead to similar results, but uh, really are driven by uh, very different kinds of forces. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, the backsliding is the result of, it's, it's this interplay between a weak state and uh, accountability where governments fail to deliver on really important issues that voters think are important that leads then to they're being delegitimated, subject to mass mobilization, and then eventually ousted. You're seeing a lot of examples of this going on right now in Latin America, you know, in Peru and Bolivia and, uh, you know, other countries in that region. Um, in other cases, uh, it's not so much that. I mean, you know, you're in a better position to explain to me what's going on in India right now because you have a similar erosion of democracy, but I think it's probably driven by different issues. Um, uh, you know, it, it may be similar in the sense that the old Congress party government really was very ineffective in delivering results, and people think that Modi uh, can do better, you know, because he's kind of a strong man. But I don't think that quite explains why uh, you're getting also support for the simultaneous replacement of a kind of liberal sense of national identity with one that uh, is based on religion and therefore much more uh, exclusionary. That's not a, you know, that's not a, a, a necessary or obvious response to, you know, the failure to implement, uh, you know, certain economic or social programs in, in, in the past. Uh, and, um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the, the things going on in Europe and in North America are yet again different because there, you know, you do have a former working class that had been the beneficiaries of an extended period of economic growth that are no longer benefiting from that. And, you know, that is a different phenomenon from what's happening in a developing country that really never had that privileged position of having a, you know, a functioning industrialized economy. Uh, and that's, a, again, a, a rather different political dynamic. Yeah, you know, I remember reading somewhere that you 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 resembled Indian democracy to sausage making, that <laughs> it 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 may look less appealing the closer one gets to the process. Um, now I you know we could use a lot of time to discuss uh, India. Um, there's one thing that uh, that you know strikes me, and that is this kind of um, fundamental disagreement in India on what the problem is. Who defines the problem? And um, if it's something that, you know, everybody agrees that, you know, if it's visible or something, you know, there's a common enemy, it's 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 all good. It's um it's kind of disagreement on who gets to define and 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 again going back to your you know identity politics, um it is uh, of course, you know, the, perhaps the lack of good and capable politicians. It may be just, you know, um the inability of the country to implement radical change. It, it is chaotic sometimes. And I sometimes wonder, you know, that this this chaos of India's democracy sometimes makes the Chinese alternative much more appealing to some countries. Um, I don't know what your take on that is. No, I'm sure it, uh, it does. Uh, I think that uh, as I think about it, actually, uh, you know, India is is kind of the polar opposite from China. China has always had a very strong state uh, and a relatively weak uh, civil society. 
Chinese people do not organize and protest and well they protest but it, it's it's they, they don't have the density of social organizations that India does and India has been in the kind of opposite situation where over the last you know 2500 years it's had relatively weak uh, central governments but very strong society that's been organized you know down to a village level and you know there's a religious infrastructure that's completely outside of the state there's a uh, uh, labor uh, uh, unions and you know peasant cooperatives and and organizations and and so forth uh, and I think that one of the problems in Indian democracy is a little bit like what's going on in the United States. I, you know, I invented this term vetocracy, yes. meaning rule by veto, where you have a democratic political system that allows a lot of groups to veto decisions by the whole. And I think that's true both in the U.S. and in India, where, and, and you see this in something like infrastructure, where, you know, you really have a big project that hurts certain people. And, you know, we've set up systems that allow the people that are hurt by it to veto the whole project. And therefore, the bridge doesn't get built or the highway doesn't get repaired uh, and so forth. Whereas in China, because they've got this strong state, they can simply override uh, those uh, uh, those interests and push for things that, um, you know, they deem to be in the general interest, uh, which, of course, then opens the way to its own set of abuses. In in that famous 1989 essay, Frank, you were very hopeful that China would become a democracy at some point, right? You said, you wrote things like, well, especially when thousands of students educated in the US or other parts of the Western world would return home and all of these ideas would spread. But that hasn't happened, has it? So, so what happened to the influence of liberal ideas in China? And is what you often say the China's default condition perhaps is one that involves a strong centralized government. Maybe I'm paraphrasing yeah, too no, much. That's true. But... Uh, well, a lot of things have happened. I mean, uh, right now uh, for a Chinese student in the United States, it's not as if American democracy looks that great. <laughs> that's true. Uh, you know, and, and I can see that in my own Chinese students that, you know, they would have said uh, we want China to be like, the United States 20 years ago, but today, I, you know, almost none of them will will say that. And in fact, a lot of them tend to be kind of contemptuous of the United States. And it's also uh, becoming difficult for them to keep studying in the U.S., right? There've been some. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's become less. It's become less welcoming uh, socially and 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 in many other ways. Um, and then, you know, I think it's really also the success of the China model, where they've managed to deliver on. Uh, stability and um, economic growth. Uh, and so I think people really don't want to upset that um, that apple cart. Uh, so all of these things, I think, you know, back in 1989 or 1992, uh, I didn't anticipate, but you know, they've they've happened. I think the biggest disappointment in many ways actually is what's happened in the United States because I really didn't think that. You know, the country would be capable of electing someone like Trump. And I didn't think that many Americans would be capable of being so fanatically attached to him. I'm sure a lot of people around the world are thinking the same kind of thoughts and the frustration and trying to understand how 73 million people could um, could vote for somebody like Mr. Trump. The final set of issues, Frank, has to do with democracy and development and the dimensions of development that I know you're interested in in thinking about. And of course, you know, we've talked a bit about political development, about the state, the rule of law, democratic accountability, but that's only one aspect of socioeconomic development. And any change in political institutions, you've argued, must be understood in the context of economic growth, social mobilization, but also the power of ideas in relation to justice and legitimacy. So we have six kind of dimensions here, the state, rule of law, democracy, together with economic growth, social mobilization, 
and and the evolution in ideas in relation to legitimacy. Is it then a matter of how these six dimensions are linked and the sequencing of these that determine the kind of development that the country is able to achieve? Uh, well, sure. I think that they really have to complement uh, each other. And if one of them is seriously out of sync with the others, for example, if you have you know reasonably good institutions, but you just have no economic growth for an extended period of time, uh, it's not going to work. If you're uh, uh, animating ideas, uh, lose legitimacy, uh, then you know the, the, the system isn't going to work. Um, so I think that you do have to have uh, uh, each of these uh, mutually supporting one another. And because they are both linked, you know, they're causally linked to one another, but they're also uh, to some degree autonomous. Uh, that's why the development process itself is so oftentimes hard to predict and, uh, and chaotic. Right now with COVID, I think we're seeing a number of things happening, uh, particularly the importance of the institutional and political factors that, you know, lacking state capacity, uh, it's very hard to deal with a pandemic. Lacking economic growth, it's very hard to compensate people that have lost jobs or to, uh, you know, keep them fed, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, even with resources and um, strong institutions, if you don't have social trust uh, in the society, if you're highly polarized, you're not going to have a, a, a good response. And then finally, it's not just about institutions, it's also about political leadership. And if you don't have the right leaders, you're not gonna have good outcomes. And we've seen you know, quite a number of examples of very poor leadership in the course of this epidemic. Um, so there's not a, you know, a kind of neat formula for how to get to any of these outcomes and you know, necessarily, like we started out talking about the sequencing, I don't think there's a single sequence either by which um, uh, you get all of these factors to work together. So a lot of it is a matter of luck and, you know, your historical circumstances, the neighborhood you live in and, and, and things like that. Frank, it was so fun to see you again, at least online and to talk to you today. I, I hope we can get to see each other again pretty soon. Um, thank you so much for coming on my show. Sure. Hopefully we'll... I'll be able to get on an airplane again, and so will you. So thanks very much for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.